Chapter 4 is autonomic drugs dealing with glaucoma treatment and also we will discuss some autonomic practice problems. When you think about glaucoma treatment, you have to think about the different types of glaucoma. So let's first focus on open angle glaucoma. This is a chronic condition with increased intraocular pressure. It's a progressive, often painless visual loss and ultimately can lead to blindness. The way that I want you to think about the treatment of glaucoma is to think about how can intraocular pressure increase in the first place. Because intraocular pressure is really a balance between fluid formation and fluid drainage. In fact, the two reasons why IOP would go up is because you're increasing fluid formation or you're decreasing fluid drainage. Therefore, the two primary strategies in treating glaucoma is to decrease aqueous humor production or to increase aqueous humor drainage. Now, all of our drugs fall into those two mechanisms. When it comes to the treatment of open angle glaucoma, our most popular drugs today are drugs like latanoprost and other prostaglandin analogs. These are PGF2 alpha analogs that can actually increase fluid drainage. Beta blockers are also very popular. Beta blockers, as we've seen earlier, will decrease aqueous humor production. In closed angle glaucoma, you're going to see a rapid rise in intraocular pressure due to the block of the canal of SLIM. So this is an acute, a painful condition, possibly even a genetic condition, where you see this rapid rise in intraocular pressure. You need emergency drug management prior to surgery. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and beta blockers are common treatments for acute closed angle glaucoma. The figure on this page does a nice job of showing you the angle in glaucoma. This is the iridocorneal angle. In fact, in closed angle, you see a shallow anterior chamber because of block of outflow drainage through the canal of SLIM. There's also a note in the margin that discusses the types of drugs we should avoid in patients with closed angle. Stay away from anti-muscarinic drugs and alpha-1 agonists because both of those drugs can actually increase intraocular pressure and never to be used in a patient who's already been diagnosed with angle closure glaucoma. Our table here looks at the mechanism of action of drugs used to treat glaucoma. The book only lists pilocarpine and timolol, and certainly both of those are drugs and mechanisms you should understand. You'll notice that I've added a few other drugs that we've mentioned in our discussion about glaucoma treatment. I've added acetazolamide. That is the classic prototype drug of the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. I've added mannitol, an osmotic diuretic, and latanoprost, which is the prototype of the PGF2 alpha drugs. But when we think about mechanisms, remember, there's only two possible mechanisms here, so let's review. For pilocarpine, a muscarinic agonist. This is a drug that's going to increase the flow, increasing the drainage through the canal of SLIM. Pilocarpine drains the fluid more effectively. Timolol, beta blockers decrease aqueous humor formation. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors also will decrease aqueous humor formation. It turns out that the enzyme carbonic anhydrase is important in the production of aqueous humor. So blocking that enzyme decreases the amount of aqueous humor that's formed. Both mannitol and prostaglandin analogs are going to increase fluid drainage. So we've got mannitol, latanoprost, and pilocarpine all drain the fluid more effectively. Beta blockers and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors to decrease aqueous humor formation. Now that we've finished our discussion of glaucoma drugs and drugs in the eye, let's do a few practice questions. Pause the video and we will discuss question one. A 55-year-old man develops loss of visual accommodation while taking an antidepressant drug. The most likely cause is blockade of which of the following receptors? Remember, when I think about accommodation, I remember that accommodation is purely parasympathetic, and it's mediated by muscarinic receptors. 
Therefore, if I get a loss of visual accommodation, that's caused by blocking muscarinic receptors. Choice D. Now, perhaps an even more challenging question for you would be this. What is the antidepressant that might be causing this problem? It's also something that we covered earlier. We were discussing groups of drugs that block muscarinic receptors, and among that list were TCAs. Tricyclic antidepressants block muscarinic receptors. They can also affect accommodation. Here's question number two. Pause the video and we will discuss. Scopolamine is prescribed as a transdermal patch for a patient leaving on a cruise vacation. Sounds kind of nice, doesn't it? Which comorbidity below would be contraindicated for the use of this drug? We have to classify the drug scopolamine. It is a muscarinic antagonist. Remember the tropes and a scope. Why would a patient take scopolamine for a cruise vacation? Because scopolamine is good for motion sickness. But the drug is a muscarinic antagonist. In which of these situations would you want to avoid using that type of drug? As we just covered, muscarinic blockers can actually increase your risk of angle closure glaucoma. They can increase intraocular pressure. Choice A is the correct answer. Notice that a muscarinic blocker would not cause problems if a patient had bradycardia. This drug would increase the heart rate and that would be okay. It does not interact with patients who have shellfish allergies. This type of drug would not be harmful for somebody with a resting blood pressure that's normal, 112 over 70 in this case. And muscarinic blockers are actually useful for patients with Parkinson's disease. So none of those others would be a contraindication for the use of this drug. Here's question number three, a very challenging question. Take your time and then we will discuss. So the figure below shows the effects of a drug on the eye, lung airway diameter, and blood vessel diameter. And we have to figure out what drug caused these effects. Well, let's start with the eye. You'll notice that the drug caused the pupil to constrict. You should come up with a couple of options for what type of drug would do that. Pupil constriction could be caused by a muscarinic agonist or by an alpha-1 antagonist. We remember the receptors in the eye controlling pupil diameter are M3 and alpha-1. Stimulating M3s or blocking alpha-1s would cause this effect. When we look at the lungs, the drug caused bronchoconstriction. Now, what are the receptors controlling airway diameter? Well, that would be beta-2 and muscarinic M3. In fact, if I stimulated M3s, I would bronchoconstrict and I would block beta-2s to bronchoconstrict. If you stop and reflect on what we've covered in those first two examples, we are thinking about this drug either being a muscarinic agonist and a muscarinic agonist, or an alpha-1 antagonist, beta-2 antagonist. If you think about what options we have to choose from, you probably are leaning kind of heavily towards the muscarinic agonist option right now. In fact, let's go to our choices and let's see if we can rule some things in or out right away. First is phenylephrine, an alpha-1 agonist. See a drug and classify that drug. Alpha-1 agonist should dilate the pupil. It doesn't even fit the first part. Amphetamines cause the release of norepinephrine from nerve terminals. With more norepinephrine, your pupils will dilate. You can rule amphetamines out as well. They don't even fit the part for the eye. What about low-dose epinephrine? Low-dose epi is beta-like, so beta-1, beta-2. should have no effect on the pupil, and the beta-2 action on the lungs should be to bronchodilate. So low-dose epinephrine doesn't fit either. We're left with physostigmine and pilocarpine. Physostigmine is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. With more acetylcholine in the eye, I get pupil constriction. With more acetylcholine in the lungs, I get bronchoconstriction. Ah, physostigmine fits both parts. Now what about pilocarpine, a muscarinic agonist? Would directly stimulate M3 receptors in the pupil to cause pupil constriction? Would also stimulate M3 receptors on the lungs to bronchoconstrict? So, so far I've not been able to distinguish choice D 
from choice E. When I go to the blood vessel, this is how I can pick, because this drug causes the blood vessel to vasodilate. Only one of these two drugs that are left as options will cause vasodilation, and that will be the direct muscarinic agonist pilocarpine. Do you remember why acetylcholinesterase inhibitors can't cause vasodilation? That's because the M3s on blood vessels are not innervated, a very important point that we made earlier. We're going to look at several of these cardiovascular trace problems. The goal for each of these types of problems is to identify the unknown drug. In this experiment, we're asked to identify drug R. The way that we're going to identify this drug is we're going to look at the control. That would be the drug all by itself. Then we're going to look at this drug in the presence of several different pretreatments. Those would include the drugs phenoxybenzamine, mecamylamine, and propranolol. Now you should recognize each of those drugs, so let's go ahead and label those now. Phenoxybenzamine, well that's an alpha blocker. The purpose of phenoxybenzamine in this experiment is to show us if drug R has any alpha effects. Propranolol is a beta blocker. Its purpose is to show us if drug R has any beta effects. But what about mecamylamine? You recognize that drug is a ganglion blocker, but what is its purpose in the experiment? Well, that's right. Its purpose is to identify reflexes. Does drug R cause any reflex effects on the heart? Really, in order to solve this type of problem in a reasonable amount of time, by the way, reasonable is defined by the exam as about a minute, you have to use some very specific strategies to quickly go through this. The most important parts of this are knowing your drugs and using your strategies. When I look at the different options for what drug R is, do you notice that each of these drugs listed epi, norepi, phenylephrine, isoproterenol, terbutylin, they're all agonists. Many times that's what the drug is going to be. It's going to be an agonist. So my suggestion to you is to always think about an agonist first because many times that's what the drug is. All right, here's our strategies. Step one, analyze the control. When I look at drug R, I notice that the blood pressure goes up. Now identify the receptor likely being stimulated. Increased blood pressure, that's alpha-1 vasoconstriction. At the same time, drug R increases the heart rate, that's beta-1 tachycardia. So step one was analyze the control, and it looks like drug R is an alpha-1, beta-1 agonist. Everybody should see that up to this point. Now, step two. We're going to go to one of the pretreatments, but my favorite pretreatment to look at next is the trace for mecamylamine. Let's go to the ganglion blocker, because the next thing that I want to solve, does drug R have any reflexes? So when I look at the trace, here's how I solve. I ask, did mecamylamine change the trace? Did the effect of drug R in the presence of mecamylamine look any different from drug R all by itself? And the answer in this case is no. Drug R had no effect. The trace looked exactly the same. The blood pressure went up and the heart rate went up. No effect of the ganglion blocker means what? It means drug R works directly on the heart, directly stimulating beta-1s. Step three, look at the alpha blocker. Make it simple. Did the alpha blocker change the shape of the trace? Yes. You'll notice that the blood pressure returned mostly to normal when we use the alpha blocker. That indicates that drug R has alpha-1 properties. And step four, did the beta blocker change the shape of the trace? The blood pressure still went up, but the heart rate did not. The beta blocker changed it, indicating that drug R has beta-1 properties. Four steps. Let's do them one more time. We look at the control. That's step one. We look at the ganglion blocker. That's step two. The alpha blocker is step three, and the beta blocker is step four. Then we make a conclusion. 
drug R has alpha-1 and beta-1 properties. Some of you are thinking, well, that's what we started with. That's what we identified in the control, but it was nice to verify that by looking at the rest of the experiment. Now, don't get that far and still miss the question. Now what I have to do is match up alpha-1 and beta-1 with the appropriate answer choice. Can you look at each of these answers and identify which receptor or receptors those drugs work on? Let's do that together. For epinephrine, it's alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2. For norepinephrine, alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1. Phenylephrine is just alpha-1, isoproteranol, beta-1 and beta-2. And terbutylin is just beta-2. Let's put that up now and look at those. The only difference in what I said and what I just put up on my slide is this. I went ahead and took out the alpha-2 portion for epi and norepi because I never identify alpha-2 having any effects on these types of examples, these types of experiments. From that information, from that receptor profiling that we just did, we can rule out phenylephrine, we can rule out isoproteranol, and we can rule out terbutylin, leaving us with epinephrine and norepinephrine. Some of you have already made up your mind. You said, well, it's got to be norepinephrine. It's a perfect fit. But you know what? I'm going to be a little bit skeptical and say, I would certainly like to rule out epinephrine just to be sure. How do you distinguish high-dose epinephrine from norepinephrine? And by the way, if this is epi, it has to be high-dose because the blood pressure is up. Do you remember how to distinguish high-dose epi from norepi? You look for epi reversal. Where in my experiment would I look for that? I look at the alpha blocker. And I ask myself, in the presence of the alpha blocker, did the blood pressure go from high to normal or high to low? And the answer is the pressure went from high to normal. Is that epi reversal? It is not. Epi reversal, the blood pressure would go below baseline. That's how we rule that it's not epinephrine, therefore drug R must be norepinephrine. Again, I recognize that some of you are going to be very critical. You're thinking, I think, Dr. Harris, you just took about seven minutes to go over that slide, yet you told me I have to answer the question in 60 seconds or less. How about if we do it again? One more time, but let's do it like you would on test day. So here's the problem. Step one analyze the control. We see that the pressure goes up, alpha 1, the heart rate goes up, beta 1. Step 2, look at the ganglion blocker, no effect. Step 3, the alpha blocker, proves that there are alpha 1 properties. Step 4, look at the beta blocker, proves that there are beta 1 properties. We conclude alpha 1, beta 1. We look at our answer choices and say, well, it could be epi or norepi, let me go look for epi reversal. Nope, it's not there. Therefore, I conclude this drug is norepinephrine. Choice B. By the way, I think that took about 40 seconds. You still had 20 seconds left over to think about it some more, but you didn't need to. If you use the strategies, you can solve these problems in the appropriate amount of time. Next, we have to solve the problem for identifying drug U. If you've not had an opportunity to try this problem on your own, I suggest you pause the video, try it, and then listen to the discussion. In order to identify drug U, step one is to analyze the control. When we give drug U, the blood pressure goes up. You have to identify that as an alpha-1 vasoconstriction. That was step one. Remember that step two, go to the ganglion blocker. Mechamylamine had no effect. The ganglion blocker had no effect on this problem. By the way, the heart rate has not changed anyway, so we didn't expect that there was a reflex happening anyway, but follow the steps nonetheless. Step three, analyze the alpha blocker. And notice that phenoxybenzamine completely prevented the action of drug U, proving to us that it was an alpha-1 effect for this drug. And step four, look at the beta blocker. Propranolol had no effect. Our conclusion, drug U is a pure alpha-1 agonist. 
Who fits that profile? That would be phenylephrine. Absolutely right. Now I have two other thoughts to share with you on this problem. First is, some of you expected to see not only phenylephrine increasing the blood pressure, but you also expected to see a reflex bradycardia. That's not something you should worry too much about. Perhaps if we'd allowed this experiment to go on even longer in time, we would have seen that reflex bradycardia caused by the increase in blood pressure. But it didn't really change how you solved the problem. You still would have gotten this problem right. A second thought is, if anybody was distracted by answer choice E, which is tyramine, that's not a common option in some of these types of problems, so let's address tyramine right now. How would you know drug U is not tyramine? Tyramine, of course, is a releaser of norepinephrine. Works very similar to amphetamines. If it causes the release of norepinephrine, that means tyramine not only gives you alpha effects, but also it gives you beta effects. If drug U was tyramine, I would have seen an immediate tachycardia caused by the beta-1 effects on the heart. Next, we will analyze drug S. If you haven't tried this problem, pause the video and do it now. In order to identify drug S, step one, analyze the control. When we give drug S, you should notice that there is an initial increase in the blood pressure, but it seems that the general trend, though, over time is that the pressure goes down. It's also evident right from the very beginning that the heart rate is going to increase. I would suggest that you go with the general trend of decreased blood pressure, increased heart rate, and therefore our analysis in step one says it's beta one and beta two. Some of you are still worried about that little blip at the beginning. Perhaps that is an effect on the heart prior to an effect on the blood vessels. When I stimulate beta ones, I increase cardiac output and that can have an influence on the blood pressure but the vasodilating effect perhaps overcame that. It's not something to worry too much about. Follow the general pattern of the graph. So step one says it looks like it's beta one and beta two. Step two, go to the ganglion blocker. Notice the ganglion blocker did not change the trace, therefore there was no effect. Importantly, what you just demonstrated was that drug S works directly on beta ones. It's a direct tachycardia instead of a reflex tachycardia. Step three, go to the alpha blocker. The alpha blocker had no effect, proving that drug S does not have any alpha properties. And then step four. Step four, go to the beta blocker. You notice that the beta blocker prevented both the decrease in the blood pressure and the increase in the heart rate. We have beta-1 and beta-2 properties. So again, if you're still bothered by the control, solve the rest of the problem and you will figure this out. So we identify that drug S has beta-1 and beta-2 effects. The best answer there, choice D, isoproteranol. Perhaps though, some of you want to make an argument for another answer choice. Can you see another answer that perhaps could also be correct here? Because I do, that choice would be epinephrine, but you would have to specify the dose. You would have to say, well, epinephrine in a low dose would be beta 1 and beta 2, and that would also be correct. So because we didn't specify the dose here, isoproteranol is still the better option. Next, we want to identify drug H. If you haven't tried this problem on your own, pause the video now, solve it, and then come back for the discussion. In order to solve drug H, step one, analyze the control. The blood pressure goes up, the heart rate goes up. An increase in blood pressure says alpha one, increase in heart rate says beta one. Now some of you right now are thinking, I've already seen this trace. We covered a drug earlier, drug R, that looked exactly the same in the control. So you're thinking, I already know that this is norepinephrine. Well, just for fun, let's continue to go through the steps and let's make sure that that's the case. Step two, analyze the ganglion blocker. Mechamylamine did not change the trace. There was no effect. So there are no reflexes in this experiment. Step three, look at the alpha blocker. 
here's something very interesting. Not only did the alpha blocker have an effect, we actually see the blood pressure decrease below baseline. In fact, that's the most important part of this diagram. Definitely proving drug H has alpha-1 properties, but perhaps already answering the question. But let's complete our steps. Step 4. The beta blocker definitely prevented the increase in heart rate, proving that drug H has beta-1 properties. Just like we did for drug R, we decided that this drug looks like an alpha-1 and beta-1 agonist, and our two choices were epinephrine and norepinephrine. But here's how you distinguish those two. Look at the alpha blocker. In the case of drug R that we covered earlier, the alpha blocker simply returned the blood pressure to normal. But this time for drug H, the blood pressure goes below baseline. And this is epi-reversal. The correct answer here is choice A. It's epi-reversal when you see high blood pressure going to low blood pressure in the presence of an alpha blocker. So always compare the trace for drug R with the trace for drug H. Next we have drug X. If you've not tried to solve this problem yet, stop the video and do so now. In order to analyze drug X, we follow the same steps that we've been doing. Step 1, analyze the control. The blood pressure goes down and the heart rate goes up. Decreased blood pressure, that's beta 2. Increased heart rate, that's beta 1. Step 2. Go to the ganglion blocker. At this point, you might have gotten very comfortable of going to the ganglion blocker part of this diagram and saying, the ganglion blocker had no effect. But you can't say that this time, can you? Look at the trace for mecamylamine. For the first time, the ganglion blocker stopped the action of this drug. The fact that the ganglion blocker had an effect proves to us the tachycardia that we observed initially was a reflex tachycardia. Go back to the beginning. The control we thought was a beta-1, beta-2 agonist. But now the ganglion blocker tells us, hey, drug X actually does not work on beta-1 receptors. The only reason it changes beta-1s is because of beta-2 vasodilation, decreased blood pressure, and reflex tachycardia. If I were you, I would go back to my thoughts on the control and I would mark out beta-1. Drug X does not work directly on beta-1s. Step 3 says look at the alpha blocker. The alpha blocker had no effect. Drug X has no alpha properties. Step 4, look at the beta blocker. Propranolol blocked both the beta-1 and the beta-2 effects of drug X. But importantly, the beta blocker does not tell you whether or not the effect on the heart rate was direct or a reflex. Propranolol, in fact, doesn't even care. It doesn't know if the action on the heart was due to direct action of the drug or a reflex sympathetic action on the heart. The most important part of this diagram, the ganglion blocker. That's what's going to rule out beta-1 as a property of this drug and help us to conclude that drug X is just a beta-2 agonist. That's why it's choice E, terbutylin. Make sure you compare drug X with drug S. A drug that we covered earlier that also we thought initially was beta-1, beta-2, but in the case of drug S, the ganglion blocker had no effect, proving to us that drug S was working directly on beta-1s. You should see how drug X is different. In this diagram, we have a couple of different drugs that we have to identify. We have to identify drug X and drug Y. If you've not had an opportunity to think about this diagram, I suggest you pause the video now and then come back and we will discuss. You might have found that this diagram was pretty challenging compared to the others that we've observed. When I think about the experiment, first we give drug X all by itself and we observe what drug X does to cardiac output, TPR, blood pressure, and respiratory resistance. Now we're adding respiratory resistance. That's something we haven't really covered previously. Notice that we give drug X. We allow it to have its effect in the body, whatever that effect is. And then that effect returns back to normal. And then we give drug X 
and y at the same time. And the purpose of the second part of the experiment is for us to see if drug y has any influence on the action of drug x. So that's how you're thinking. It's x all by itself, and then it's x in the presence of drug y. And from this, we should be able to solve what type of drugs we're dealing with. You should follow this rule that you always look at TPR and blood pressure before you look at cardiac output. In fact, in this experiment, TPR and blood pressure are going to be exactly the same thing, and most of the time that is going to be the case. So look at TPR and blood pressure first, and then look at cardiac output. The good news for you about respiratory resistance, it does not matter when you look at respiratory resistance. I could cover respiratory resistance first, or it could be the last thing that I look at in this experiment, and I can still get it right. So let's start with TPR and blood pressure. When I give drug X, TPR and blood pressure go down. That looks like a vasodilating action, and if you're thinking vasodilator, perhaps that is a beta-2 agonist effect. Once again, if you look at what my options are for drug X, all of my answer choices are agonists. So a beta-2 agonist would fit the profile for drug X. I then allow the blood vessel and the blood pressure to return back to normal. Then I give drug X and drug Y at the same time. And now nothing happens. I don't see any effect when I give both of those drugs at the same time. You have to come up with what type of option, what type of drug could Y be that is going to prevent the action of drug X. Maybe you're thinking, well, drug Y is a beta blocker. If it was blocking the beta 2 effect caused by drug X, then I wouldn't see any change in TPR or blood pressure. But I bet you can come up with a second option for what drug Y could be. Because besides pharmacologically opposing drug X, could drug Y physiologically oppose drug X? I mean, what's the other receptor on your blood vessel that would do the opposite of what a beta-2 agonist would do? Well, if I stimulated alpha-1 receptors, an alpha-1 agonist would vasoconstrict, and that would oppose the vasodilating actions caused by a beta-2 agonist. So those are my two options for what drug Y could be, beta blocker or alpha-1 agonist. Now let's go to cardiac output. You have to be very critical here as I look at what drug X does to cardiac output. Immediately when I give drug X at the arrow, nothing happens. There's no immediate effect of drug X on cardiac output. Do you notice how as a little bit of time passes, there is no change in cardiac output? But if I wait long enough, I see an increase in cardiac output. So what does that time delay in the effect of drug X indicate to you? It indicates to me that there was no direct effect of drug X on the heart. In other words, drug X does not have any direct beta-1 effects. But I can get a reflex increase in cardiac output, and that happened because the blood pressure was decreased. The drop in blood pressure caused by drug X led to a reflex tachycardia and increased cardiac output. I then allow the cardiac output to return to normal. Now I give X and Y at the same time, and what happens to cardiac output? Nothing. The reason why the cardiac output didn't change is because the blood pressure did not change. If the pressure stays normal, I'm not going to get any kind of reflex tachycardia and increase in cardiac output. The most important part of analyzing the cardiac output here was to show that drug X did not have any direct effect on the heart. So it wasn't beta 1. Now, let's solve for respiratory resistance. When I give drug X, respiratory resistance decreases. That indicates that I am bronchodilating. A decrease in respiratory resistance is consistent with what we thought drug X was, which is beta-2 agonist. I allow respiratory resistance to return to normal. Then I give drug X and Y at the same time. Do you notice that I get the same thing? That I still see a decrease in respiratory resistance. In this case, 
drug Y did not block the action of drug X. This is very critical. If Y doesn't block drug X, then Y is not a beta blocker. Remember how earlier we came up with two options for what drug Y could be? We just eliminated one of those options. Since Y is not a beta blocker, you should be thinking that Y is an alpha-1 agonist. And we've already illustrated that we think that drug X is a beta-2 agonist. Do you find a pair of drugs that matches up with that? Sure, look at choice D. Terbutalin, beta-2 agonist, and phenylephrine, alpha-1 agonist. In this graph, we're asked to identify drug X. But in the experiment, we're having to look at the effects of acetylcholine. If you haven't had an opportunity to spend some time thinking about this question, do so now. Pause the video, come back, and we will discuss. In this experiment, we're looking at blood pressure and heart rate changes in the presence of acetylcholine. Notice how we give acetylcholine first. We observe its effects on blood pressure and heart rate, but we allow the blood pressure and heart rate to return back to normal before we give drug X. We then give drug X, and notice while drug X is still working, we give acetylcholine a second time. Many folks will have trouble with this graph because they don't look for the big picture concept. The big picture is this. This is an experiment where we look at acetylcholine all by itself versus acetylcholine in the presence of drug X. So let's analyze acetylcholine all by itself first. So the blood pressure goes down. That is an M3 vasodilation. That's stimulating those M3s on blood vessels and that would happen if I gave you acetylcholine as a drug. At the same time, when I give acetylcholine, I will see a decrease in the heart rate. That's an M2-mediated bradycardia. So those are the immediate effects of acetylcholine. But notice that the heart rate does not stay down. The heart rate, in fact, goes up above normal. I see a tachycardia. You should identify that effect as a reflex tachycardia. Why did I get a reflex tachycardia with acetylcholine? Because my blood pressure was decreased and the blood vessel will overcome the direct action on the heart. Now, both the heart rate and the blood pressure have returned back to normal. So now we give drug X. Drug X increases the heart rate but decreases the blood pressure. Now, some of you are ready to answer this question. You're thinking, well, tachycardia, that's beta 1. Decrease in blood pressure, that's beta 2. Beta 1, beta 2, that's isoproteranol. And you go look at your answer choices, and it's not there. But you also remember, I said earlier, that if it's not isoproteranol, it could be low-dose epinephrine. So now you go look at your answer choices, and you say, that's not there either. So at this point, are you ready to give up? No. Don't give up. Keep going just for fun, because that's all we're doing, folks, is we're just having fun. Notice that while drug X is still working, we give acetylcholine. Answer this question, and I guarantee you, you will get this right. What is different when I give acetylcholine the second time compared to when I gave it the first time? Well, what's similar is that the blood pressure still goes down, the heart rate still goes down, but what's missing from the right side of the picture that was there on the left side? Don't you see it? There's no reflex tachycardia. The heart rate is down and the blood pressure is down, but I don't see an increase in the heart rate. Somehow, drug X must have prevented reflexes. Now, doesn't that give you another option for what it could be? What type of drug blocks all reflexes? And that would be ganglion blockers. So we have one of those in choice A, hexamethonium. That's what drug X is. It's a ganglion blocker. It's not the most obvious answer choice if you analyze the properties of drug X. So let's answer the question of why does a ganglion blocker decrease blood pressure but increase heart rate? Do you remember how to summarize the properties of ganglion blockers? Ganglion blockers block the dominant system. So who's the dominant system on heart rate? 
Is it sympathetic or parasympathetic? Now, the heart is an organ that's dually innervated, so parasympathetics dominate. Ganglion blockers give you the opposite effect of the dominant system. So what's opposite of a parasympathetic effect on the heart? That's right, tachycardia. That's what we get. Who's the dominant system on your blood vessels? Blood vessels are only innervated by sympathetics. Sympathetics are dominant, and they would vasoconstrict. So what does a ganglion blocker do? The opposite. Vasodilates, decreasing the blood pressure. That's why drug X, that's why ganglion blockers would have this particular profile. Increased heart rate, decreased blood pressure. There's a question at the bottom of the slide that asks, what would you expect to see if the infused drug was neostigmine? What I would like for you to do is substitute neostigmine for acetylcholine at the beginning of this experiment. If I infused neostigmine, the heart rate would go down because with more acetylcholine at the heart, I'm going to see bradycardia. But would neostigmine affect your blood pressure? Would it do anything to your blood vessels? The answer is no. Neostigmine, an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, has no effect on those M3s on your blood vessels because they're not innervated. So it would be a totally different experiment if we were using neostigmine. Here's a diagram that asks us to identify five different drugs. Give this question some thought. Come back and we will discuss. When I look at this question, I have to carefully read the information that we're given. Let's do that now. It tells us that contractile force is measured in an isolated arterial preparation. Heart rate is measured in an isolated heart preparation. You have to form a very important conclusion right from the beginning, and that is, this is not a whole body experiment. The blood vessel has been isolated. It's a blood vessel in a water bath in a laboratory somewhere. Heart rate has been, the heart has been isolated from the body. So we measure heart rate in a water bath. So this is kind of like the mad scientist experiment. It's not a whole body experiment. And importantly, that means there are no reflexes. There are no reflexes. Maybe this makes it a little bit simpler because every action of the drugs that we see here is a direct effect of that drug. We also see in the experimental design that there's no washout between drugs. And what that means is sometimes we give a second drug while the first one is still working. There's also another challenge. When we look at our answer choices for the first time, we not only have agonists as options, but we have antagonists as options. So that mixes up our choices here. But I'm going to suggest this strategy. When you look at the drugs, go for the most obvious answer and see if it fits. Take a look at drug one. When we give drug one, it does nothing to the heart, but it does constrict the blood vessel. Now, what's the easiest explanation for a vasoconstrictor? Well, I would say that would be an alpha-1 agonist. Now, look at your answer choices. Do you see an alpha-1 agonist there? Sure. Phenylephrine, choice E. So that fits. Let's keep going. When we give drug two, you should observe that drug one is still vasoconstricting. Remember, no washout sometimes, so one is still working to vasoconstrict, and two seems to reverse the effects of drug one. What's the simplest explanation for how drug two could reverse the action of drug one? Well, that would mean that drug two is an alpha-1 blocker. Perhaps you're looking for a zosin, like prazosin, but it's not an option. But don't you see an answer choice there that at least blocks alpha-1s, even if it also blocks alpha-2s? Sure, the drug phenoxybenzamine blocks both alpha-1 and alpha-2, and it would reverse the effects of an alpha-1 agonist. Now we're back to normal. The blood vessel is back to normal. When we give drug 3, the heart rate goes up and the blood vessel relaxes. Increase in heart rate, you might be thinking beta-1 agonist. Vasodilation, perhaps you're thinking beta-2 agonist. 
So drug three, beta one, beta two agonist, is of course isoproteranol. Nope, not an option. But what is an alternative choice besides isoproteranol? This could be low dose epinephrine. Epi could be an option for drug number three. When we give drug number four, the heart rate is still increased and the blood pressure, or the blood vessel rather, is vasodilated. So drug number four is given while drug three is still working. The heart rate comes back to normal. The blood vessel goes back to normal. Drug four completely reversed drug three. How would you stop a beta-1, beta-2 agonist with a beta-1, beta-2 blocker? Do you have one of those? Sure, you have the drug Pendolol as an option for drug 4. Of course, if you've solved the first four drugs, it's pretty easy to identify drug 5. It's the one that's left. I actually think that drug 5 is the hardest one just on, on its own merit to identify. If I look at drug 5, the heart rate goes down. Certainly, I could think about a muscarinic agonist being an option for that, but so could I think about a beta-1 blocker, causing a decrease in the heart rate. What are my options for the blood vessel vasodilating? Muscarinic agonist vasodilate, beta-2 agonist vasodilate, alpha-1 antagonist will vasodilate. That's why I think drug 5 is a little bit more difficult. I have multiple things to think about for what it could be. But if I put the blood vessel and the heart rate information together, there's only one receptor that they have in common, and that was stimulating muscarinic receptors. And we have the drug bethanacol there as an option. So to summarize, drug one is phenylephrine. Drug two, phenoxybenzamine. Drug three is epinephrine, presumably in a low dose. Drug four is pendolol, and drug five, bethanacol. In this experiment, you're asked to answer the following question given the information shown about this person's right eye and left eye. If you haven't had a chance to try this on your own, do so now, pause the video, come back and we will discuss. When I look at the experiment, notice that without treatment, this person's right eye is bigger than their left eye. So automatically I'm interested in this person. Their eyes are different sizes. But when I analyze the design of the experiment, I'm comparing amphetamine to phenylephrine and the action of those two drugs on this person's eyes. Now let's identify what those drugs are. Amphetamines are indirect agonists. They're drugs that cause the release of norepinephrine from adrenergic nerves. Whereas phenylephrine is a direct alpha-1 agonist. Phenylephrine directly stimulates alpha-1 receptors in the eye. That's the key to this question. One drug working directly on the eye, the other drug working on the presynaptic nerve. When I give amphetamine, the person's right eye dilates as expected. I get medriasis. But their left eye does not respond. No effect from amphetamine in the left eye. When I give phenylephrine, I get medriasis of the right eye. The right eye dilates just as I would expect. The left eye dilates, but to a significant effect. I get significant medriasis when I give phenylephrine to the left eye. From this information, we're asked to respond to the question that these responses are compatible with the conclusion that the left eye had what? Can you answer this question? Is this a receptor problem in the left eye, or is it a transmitter problem? That's the key. It's not a receptor problem, because phenylephrine was able to dilate the left eye. It definitely has alpha-1 receptors. The problem with the left eye is with the neurotransmitter. And the reason that you know that is because a drug like amphetamine, which causes the release of norepinephrine, Norepinephrine should be able to stimulate alpha-1s to dilate the pupil, but it seems like amphetamine is unable to do that in this experiment. Perhaps it's because the left eye is lacking adrenergic innervation. If you look at the option choice E, denervation of the radial muscle would explain why the left eye does not respond to an indirect agonist, no nerve, but it does respond to a direct agonist 
because it's got receptors. Maybe the remaining question is, why did the left eye dilate so significantly when I gave that person phenylephrine? Well, if the left eye does not have innervation, how does the pupil, how, are the, how is the radial muscle specifically going to respond to the lack of stimulation? Because it wants to be stimulated, it's going to upregulate its alpha-1 receptors. When I finally add an agonist like phenylephrine, I get major pupil dilation because of all of the alpha-1s there on the left eye. It's what's called denervation supersensitivity. You get a significant response due to the lack of innervation and the upregulation of receptors. Our last diagram asks us to analyze four different drugs, looking at their effects on the heart rate, and then identify each of those drugs. Take some time, if you've not already, and review this problem, and come back and we will discuss. Because this problem deals with heart rate changes, many folks find this one even more challenging than some of the others that we've covered. But folks, let me reassure you, it's the same strategies that we've used previously. Step one, analyze the control. When I look at drug P, I notice that it causes an increase in the heart rate. It causes tachycardia. Step two, you know what step two is, analyze the ganglion blocker. When I look at the ganglion blocker hexamethonium, all I have to do is say, did the ganglion blocker change the control? And the answer for drug P is yes. The ganglion blocker changed the control. What does that mean for us? It means that drug P caused a reflex tachycardia. Now, go with this thought. If drug P caused a reflex tachycardia, what had to happen to your blood pressure in order to cause a reflex tachycardia? Your blood pressure must have decreased which means drug P is probably a vasodilator. Vasodilators would decrease the pressure and cause a reflex tachycardia. When I look at my answer choices here, let's identify how many vasodilators we have to choose from. If I give acetylcholine as a drug, that's a vasodilator through M3 receptors. If I give hydralazine, that's a vasodilator. Norepinephrine is never going to be a vasodilator. It's only a vasoconstrictor. Isoproteranol, which is beta-1 and beta-2, the beta-2 action of this drug means that it vasodilates. But this drug cannot be isoproteranol. The reason is isoproteranol works directly on beta-1s to cause tachycardia, and a ganglion blocker would not have changed that effect. Because the ganglion blocker had an effect, this drug cannot be isoproteranol. Choice E is edrophonium, an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Acetylcholinesterase inhibitors do not vasodilate. Those M3s on blood vessels are not innervated. When I think about it, I only have two choices for drug P, acetylcholine, hydralazine. Go to the next part of my experiment. If this drug was acetylcholine, it would have to vasodilate through muscarinic receptors. And if that was the case, atropine would have an effect. But when I look at the experimental data, atropine had no effect. It cannot be acetylcholine. I'm left with one choice. Drug P is hydralazine. Let's solve for drug Q. When I give drug Q, the heart rate goes down. I get bradycardia. Step two, go to the ganglion blocker. The ganglion blocker changed the trace. Don't worry right now about the fact that the bar flipped from down to up. You should just start with step one. The bradycardia was caused by a reflex. That's what the ganglion blocker is telling us. The ganglion blocker says drug Q caused reflex brady. But what did drug Q do to the blood pressure to cause that to happen? Since the heart rate went down, the blood pressure must have gone up. Drug Q must be a vasoconstrictor. I actually think you've just solved this problem because how many vasoconstrictors are on our list? Just one. Only norepinephrine fits the, the profile of being a vasoconstrictor. But you know, people want to know, why did the bar flip like that? 
it's pretty clear with drug P that the ganglion blocker just prevented the reflex tachycardia. But what's going on with drug Q? It seems like bradycardia or tachycardia perhaps are properties of this drug. Well, let's review something that we covered earlier. What do we know about norepinephrine? We know that norepinephrine has direct alpha-1 and direct beta-1 effects. So initially we get tachycardia with this drug. But over time, the fact that we have an increase in blood pressure causes a reflex bradycardia to occur. So isn't it true that norepinephrine can both increase and decrease the heart rate? One is direct, one is a reflex. What does the ganglion blocker take away? It takes away the reflex. So what's left for norepinephrine to do? That's right, cause tachycardia. Anytime I see a heart rate graph go from down to up or vice versa, that indicates to me we have a drug that can have both direct and reflex effects on the heart. In fact, we see the same exact thing happen in the presence of atropine. Atropine blocks the bradycardia, leaving us only with norepinephrine causing direct tachycardia. Next, let's look at drug R. Drug R causes tachycardia. Step two says go to the ganglion blocker. The ganglion blocker had no effect, indicating that the tachycardia caused by drug R was direct. This must be a direct beta-1 effect. When I look at my options that are there, my choice is going to be isoproteranol. Isoproteranol would consistently give me tachycardia as a direct beta-1 effect. And that effect is not going to be overcome by any type of reflex. So drug R might have been one of the easier ones to solve. Direct beta-1 effects fits the profile for isoproteranol. Finally, we have drug S. Drug S caused tachycardia. Step two, look at the ganglion blocker, proves that it was a reflex tachycardia. Kind of similar to what we solved earlier for drug P, if drug S is causing a reflex tachycardia, that means the blood pressure must have gone down. Drug S must be a vasodilator. We come up with the same thought for drug P, and we looked at the options and we concluded that there are really only two possible vasodilators, acetylcholine and hydralazine. So how do you choose between those two? Well, if drug S is really acetylcholine, then atropine should stop it because atropine blocks muscarinic receptors. And when we look at that part of our experiment, we see that atropine does stop the action of drug S, proving to us that drug S was acetylcholine, distinguishing it from hydralazine.